it's not a story, just a pitch that you're okay. a great example of okay. just getting involved. Uh, out through the clubs, through career trips, through all these different activities we have, focus Fridays, uh, great opportunities. If you take advantage of it, sky's the limit. Yeah, I 100 percent agree with that. I think that's uh before I get into my career, if I I want to add on to that plug is if you get I'll, I'll rephrase what I was about to say. In addition to what you're learning in the classroom, which is incredibly important and you will use it every day in finance, some aspect of that. Where you're going to get where you want is by leveraging your network, right? Professor Whippy, I only call him Ryan, that was weird. Ryan knows a thousand different students that are doing a thousand different things, a thousand different places. I promise you, he can help you identify somewhere you want to go, right? Or someone to talk to. Paul Fell said, I mean, there's, I mean, I don't know all the professors that are here now, but they all have contacts in the world of finance that are all doing different, different things and a lot, of really, a lot of really cool things. So leverage that by going to their offices, taking advantage of, of, of their, office time, not only to, to make, sure, make sure you're understanding the content and, and getting through the courses and acing exams and whatnot, but also to pick their brains on careers and who to talk to and why to talk to them and what does this career look, look like versus that career and who can I talk to and that's doing investment banking or risk management or commercial banking, and they will connect you, right? Um, I mean, that's the point of this class to some extent. Yeah. Let you guys see what's out there and uh, start connecting some of those dots. Yeah. I, I do have card so if anybody wants one afterwards please you know feel free to come up and i'm happy to give you a card and continue a conversation over time but i want to make sure it's freshman and sophomore in this class uh no there's all but I'll all ranges more, okay more freshmen and sophomores than juniors and seniors okay so kind of an early level class so they can kind of get things figured out ahead of time but we have some seniors in here as well so yeah okay great um i would say <clears throat> the earlier you get involved the better as well I didn't start getting involved and really start pushing my involvement until the end of my sophomore year, but really, really mid junior year is when I started really getting involved. And uh, that's when I started the, the investment banking club, which was a lot of fun. And, and like, like Ryan said, we didn't have as many career options in, in, in that area. And I was interested and there were some models elsewhere that I went and spoke with either the professor or the students that were involved in those clubs or those societies that they call them at other schools and tried to bring that model to Utah State, the Huntsman School. And sounds like it's, it's continuing and that, that, that's really awesome to hear that. Uh, but as well, the career trips, I think are incredibly valuable. And as Ryan said, that my first career trip to, to New York City ended up being, turning into my first job. And Dave, so I, as, when I served as, as a business center, I worked with Dave Patel, who's uh, so, associate dean still, yep, associate dean. And he had told me about this, this company and this guy named John Lafredo, who's a Utah State grad, and that he hosts students at almost every year, if not every year, uh, at, their, at, at their company headquarters in New York City. And I remember doing a little bit of research before we went on that trip, thinking, man, if these guys are hiring, that would be something that would be pretty cool. And when he was done presenting, I, I, I was a, it was Q&A and I raised my hand. And I said, do you hire undergrads? And if so, can I talk to you? And he said, well, we don't hire that many, but we will be hiring in Los Angeles. If you're interested, let's talk. And six months later, I had a, had a job offer, which was pretty, pretty cool. Um, I can't emphasize that enough. Get involved and just ask a lot of questions to your professors network as boring as talking about networking is and going to a networking event, it can be incredibly powerful and change the direction of your career, which impacts your life. I don't want to, sounds a little dramatic to say it'll change your life, but really it will. Um, and I, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to beat that for too long, but do it. I promise you it'll pay dividends. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So talking about investment banking today. And how I got here, I'll talk, talk to you a little bit about my career path. So as I said, I started with, with a guy named John Lafredo at a firm called Mackay Shields, which is a boutique fixed income asset management shop, which means that we manage a lot of money for institutions or high net worth individuals. 
in across mutual funds, which is more of a retail product, meaning that you and I that don't have hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars to have someone manage for me, we have a couple thousand dollars, we can buy a mutual fund share. And now that is being managed by some asset manager, right? So we manage mutual funds, we manage separately managed accounts, which is the big rich guy that has hundreds of millions of dollars. One, one client of ours was a family member of the largest private company in the world that's based, I don't remember where Cargo, where's Cargo based, you remember? Somewhere in the United States. Uh, and <laughs> they wanted a separately managed account. It's, it's kind of a funny story. And, <laughs> excuse me, we were talking about some, some examples that I covered. So I was on the phone with this guy and he's like, well, this all sounds pretty good, but can you guys handle $500 million in one account? $500 million. So he's like, yeah, I've got to put some money to work. So he gave us $500 million and his daughter who lived in California had another $200 million. She ended up giving us to manage. It was a, a incredible amount of money that just seemed like play money to them. So that was kind of what we did. I, I, served, I was a credit analyst. So I analyzed bonds, both in the secondary market, meaning like when you're trading stocks on uh, like Robinhood or what other brokerage account you might have. I was a credit analyst, not on Robin Hood or something, but I was investing, I was, I was analyzing those, those bonds, right? Making sure from an investment perspective, if we buy this bond, we're protected and we're going to be able to make money. And I worked with our portfolio managers who actually put in the orders and actually manage the money. So I sat on a trading floor and I covered a sector we call DIRT, which is real estate development. And that got me to investment banking eventually, because I knew the, the investment banking teams that were packaging deals and selling them to my firm and others like my, my, my past firm. And they were expanding into Utah. We wanted to get back to Utah at the time and it was a pretty good fit. So I, I jumped aboard Piper Sandler. So that's my career path. I'm happy to ask, answer any questions about that at any time, but to get into the subject, investment banking. When I, the first time I ever heard about investment banking, I assumed an investment banker was the guy I go to to help me invest my money. I go to him and say, hey, I, I've got $10,000 I want to put to work somewhere. What do I do with it? That is not investment banking. Investment banking really is someone that organizes large or complex financial transactions from mergers and acquisitions to a stock IPO, right? So when some really cool technology company issue stock, they go to an investment bank to help structure that and then sell that to the public, right? Um, or, a, or a debt offering, which is why I, I do debt today. Same idea as a stock offering, it's just debt, right? So a different instrument, paid back, it's not equity. Um, everything that an investment bank or investment bankers do has something to do with raising money for a company, or for a government entity, or maybe even a, a very high net worth individual or something like that. Um, sorry, I'm battling a little bit of cough. And when I start talking a lot, I have to cough a lot. So I will be pausing once in a while. Any questions so far of what, like from that very basic definition of what investment banking is, any questions? Okay. To give you an example, a few examples of like, who are the investment banking firms you could potentially work for? There's kind of two, <coughs> two definitions of sizes of investment banks. One is, the first is a bulge bracket bank. Bulge bracket, sorry. Bulge bracket investment banks are the larger investment banks that deal with very large transactions, right? So you've got Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Barclays, RBC, Citigroup, Credit Suisse, Deutsche Bank. Those are kind of the, the bulge bracket names that are, you can also think of them are, are, are generally speaking like the more prestigious firms. They, they do the, the bigger, the cooler, the sexier deals. They do the the big time IPOs for stocks, um, 
any big merger or acquisitions, you know, several billion dollar acquisition probably has one of their names as a financial advisor. In, excuse me. Yeah, I didn't get a cough drop or something. Mergers and acquisitions, if you're not familiar with that term, it is when a two companies or a company is buying another company or acquiring a company, or if they're merging, right, they're joining forces with a company that is a merger, right? So an investment banker would serve as an advisor. Your investment banking team would, would say, okay, Apple, you're buying Amazon to be ridiculous, right? You're buying Amazon. This is what your company looks like today from a financial perspective. This is what it looks like tomorrow after buying Amazon, right? Here's some opportunities. Here's some weaknesses. Here's some threats from a financial perspective. How you can pull this off is by raising more money. You've got all of this cash on your book, about a, probably, what, what does Apple have? Like a hundred and something billion in cash? Or you could raise, you could go issue new stock or we could go raise more debt for you. And that's what that would look like. And these are all the different options of how to buy Amazon, right? That's what a, that's an investment banker would do. That's pretty cool. Sometimes the hours, which we'll get into, the hours can be a lot, but it's pretty cool to turn around and say, yeah, I'm advising. I mean, you actually wouldn't say this until it's public, or until you will be fired or fined heavily. Um, but it's pretty cool. I think it's pretty cool to say, hey, yeah, I advise Apple on this acquisition of these five different companies that they bought. And let me tell you about those. I think that's pretty cool. Or, you know, you're at a social gathering and people are asking you like, well, geez, that's really cool. Apple bought all these things and you were involved in that. That's pretty, I, I, find, I find it a lot of fun. The, the boutique firms get involved with bigger transactions, but generally speaking, are part of a syndication. A syndication meaning there's just a lot, there's a lot of different banks involved, a lot of different advisors. And that's generally because it's a really big deal. A lot of money's being transferred or used or raised and they need, they just need more hands on deck, right? Those firms, and they're not, really any less prestigious. They just do different deals. Generally speaking, boutique firms are a little bit smaller. When they, when they handle deals on their own, they're a little bit smaller deals. So instead of a $5 billion deal, it's a $3 billion deal or a $2 billion deal. Or it's, they get down a lot of times in the several hundred million. You're probably not going to see a deal that is like 100 million or less in a boutique firm in, in, from a mergers and acquisitions perspective just because of... of time where they want to spend their time and efforts, right? You have lower middle market banks that will do that. But those boutique firms are a firm like mine, Piper Sandler, uh, Jeffries, Stiefel, Baird, Lazard, Morgan Keegan, Guggenheim, Houlihan, Loki, uh, Perella Weinberg, Evercore, and Molis. Those are all boutique investment banking firms. Another difference between those two is where they operate. Boutique firms generally operate just within the country. They don't operate globally. Whereas obviously we know JP Morgan and Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, they all have operations around the world. And, that, and that's probably the more important differ, you know, differentiation between the two firms because you know, I know Piper Sandler has done several multi-billion dollar deals that they beat out you know, some of the bold bracket banks for. And they were the lead advisor or the sole advisor. So that, that's... That can be kind of the line of delineation of, between the boutique and a bulge bracket bank, but it's mainly about where they operate. Um, any questions about who the players are? Seen or been a part of? <laughs> uh, so, so what I do in investment banking is not mergers and acquisitions. It's a little bit different. It's real estate focused in a very kind of spe specific part of real estate. But the biggest deal that I've done and been a part of is $260 million bond deal. Um, but I mean, Piper Sandler has done several four, five, six $6 billion acquisition deals. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, let me, let me talk a little bit about who, who the, like, like, like ranks and titles with an investment bank. 
actually, no, I don't want to talk about that yet. Investment banking and how we do what we do, it, we, we can't do everything on our own, right? Investment bankers, if I can draw a little bit, there's two sides of our business. There's the investment banking side, and then there's the sales and trading side, right? We interface with corporations, in my case, real estate development companies or real estate investment companies. Um, and for the most part, sometimes it gets blended. For the most part, these guys are working with hedge funds or some type of asset manager, a credit fund, or a private equity fund or a venture capital fund. This side is, is the money, right? Sales and trading is, are the guys that interface with the money. Right? So in, in, any, in any bank, at least investment banking bank, where as we know, like JP Morgan is part of uh, Chase Bank, right? That's, that's more retail, mortgages, car loans, same with Bank of America. Goldman Sachs is starting to get into it just a little bit. Morgan Stanley, not as much. But in investment banking, Piper Sandler has this. This is a model of Piper Sandler, as well as any, any bulge bracket bank, right? On the, on the high finance side, of, which is investment banking. We interface with our corporate clients, where we tell them, we advise them on an acquisition or an equity raise or a debt raise. And we're kind of structuring it behind the scenes with them showing them a pro forma of, this is what your company looks like today. When we raise new equity, this is what it looks like tomorrow, right? And this is based on your projections or the projections we're giving you. This is what, you know, these are the opportunities, these are the threats, right? Then at some point we cross over and start talking to ourselves in trading floor as we get closer to actually raising debt, needing to actually pull the trigger and get companies to give us money. We start interfacing with the sales and trading floor that gives us some real live, you know, live intel of, well, you're never going to be able to sell plural site stock or, or what's another one that just went public in Utah? Qualtrics? Qualtrics is still public, aren't they? Yeah, they went public. So let's pretend like we're advising Qualtrics on, an, on a second equity raise, right? We had to go to sales and trading floor and, and say, Qualtrics is our client. This is what they want to do. This is how we're thinking about structuring this deal. Where should we price it? We have some, some intel before that, which, which informs everything we're talking about with, our, with Qualtrics on the, on behind the scenes. But then we get to the sales and trading floor and they start giving us live market updates. Well, Qualtrics is viewed like this in the market. This is what our investors might think of Qualtrics uh, and the opportunities there. And therefore, we think a price range between here makes a little bit more sense. Or, hey, Ben, you're right on the money. You've got, you've got the right price range. So eventually, you know, all of that communication is happening between us. And then we're back to the client and giving them that information. And then we get to a pricing day or a roadshow with equity where we go and visit the banking team and the sales and trading representative, the guy that interfaces with that hedge fund or the credit fund or the private equity team and, and generally sales and trading is not involved in private equity and venture capital. It's a little bit more securities driven, but we will interface with those guys and start pitching them the story of the company that we're, we're talking about. Right. And then there becomes, there's a day where we say you need to submit your order or your bid for that company or for that stock. And that's how we actually raise the money. Right. Um, the different responsibilities are sometimes are, 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 blend, are, are blurred, like with private equity and venture capital. A sales and trading floor might have a relationship with a private equity firm, but generally speaking, an investment banker would do that as well, right? So they, they might have a company, maybe Qualtrics wants to sell itself again and go private, and they go to private equity shops like BlackRock or you know, you know, some other big shop that buys companies. They, they, the banking team might have a relationship, is, is more likely to have a relationship with that private equity firm than a sales and trading floor would. Um,
I'm going to go through different, different responsibilities within an investment banking team. Yeah. I was going to ask, why do you prefer investment banking to uh, working with stolen trades? Or why, what, like, why do you get into investment banking and not regular trading? Because I don't know, it's more, well, I don't know, I don't want to say it's like open to, like I've, I've heard of more seldom trading than investment banking. Yeah. So why do you get into investment banking? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so I actually started out here, right? I was, a, I was an asset manager. So I interfaced, how I, met, how I started talking to Piper Sandler was through the sales and trading floor relationship. It would have made a lot of sense to be on a sales and trading floor on my, based on my first job. <clears throat> how I got to investment banking is this investment banking team, right? Would interface with the sales and trading floor and they would come and talk to me at the credit fund, right? And I happened to be, from Utah, where they wanted to expand and do, do deals in Utah, only in Utah, that, that could really only be done in Utah. So they wanted someone with context in Utah, which was me, right? So the investment banking team said, hey, you understand what we do and we like you and you like us, you wanna join us. That's kind of really how it came to be. We'll, we'll get into a little bit of the pros and cons. Um, sales and trading, in my opinion, can be high stress all the time, which is true in, about investment banking. It's just different, different stress, uh, or at least different people that you're stressing with. Yeah. I will. So sales and trading reacts to, to, to markets live, right? So some news event happens and markets are going wild. They will be on the phone all the time with hedge funds that are pissed off because they just lost millions of dollars. And you sold them that security last week, right? So if you're on the sales and trading floor, you sell a bond to someone and next week news hits that they lost hundreds of millions of dollars. Now they're calling you and they wanna, they wanna beat you up, metaphorically, not physically. That's pretty stressful, right? You're talking about money that has just lost hundreds of millions of dollars. On the, on the buy side where I was, I'm managing all that. I'm the one that just lost a hundred million dollars. And now I've got to report to Mr. High net worth individual that gave me his $500 million and tell him why I made a decision to buy that credit that lost a hundred million dollars of his money. Right. That's, that's stressful. Investment banking is stressful because you're on the other side of the transaction telling Qualtrics, telling Ryan Smith, yeah, we think we can raise you one and a half billion dollars in this market and uh he wants to see all different iterations of 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 the structure tomorrow right but that takes several hours to do so your stress is how long you're sitting in the in, in your chair at at the office you call your wife call your you know whoever you call your family and tell them yeah we had dinner plans we don't anymore and now they're mad because you've canceled the last seven nights in a row because you're doing the same thing you were doing. You're working, right? Um, but then you, you start getting into, involved in the stress of selling the deal as well. So it's just like, I mean, so sometimes it's blended, but it, it, generally speaking, it's different because of where you're at on the transaction. So you obviously prefer investment banking now? I don't know if I prefer it. It's just what I'm doing right now. Um, I had a lot of fun on, on the on the buy side of sales and sales and trading right the fun side of that is describe it you said buy side so they're selling yeah. buy side sales side. so when you refer to it what, what do you mean yeah so the buy side is the money side they're the ones that make a decision whether they want to buy something or not right they want to invest their money the sell side is i'm coming as an investment banker or the sales and trading floor and selling you a bond or a stock or a company and you're buying it that, that's that's the difference effectively right a, a really awesome, exciting part of sales and trading and, and being on asset management of buying a stock or buying a bond is that it can be really exhilarating when you buy a thing and tomorrow it's up 25% and you look like the king, right? When you told your portfolio manager, yeah, you really ought to buy that because of all these different reasons. And then tomorrow it goes up and he's looking at you like, holy crap, how'd you know? You're like, yeah, I'm just that good, man. Uh, you feel that way, they know better, but uh, it, it's, it's a lot of fun. That, that's, that is, 
it's pretty exhilarating to do that. I think for me, it, what I do is a little bit less stressful than like a merger and acquisitions investment banker in terms of my work hours. I, I leave at five o'clock every day, um, but that's just the nature of what we do and who we deal with. Our, we're, we're a real estate developer. Our clients are real estate developers. They leave at four, right? Maybe even three. And we're just doing the follow-up work afterwards and then we go home, right? Whereas sometimes in investment banking, in emerging acquisitions, your managing director, the, the head honcho may, might call you at seven o'clock at night when you are just about to get to the restaurant to have dinner with your family and calls you and says, hey, got a meeting at 8.30 in the morning. I need a hundred page document slideshow of these different iterations of this merger and acquisition or the, this acquisition. Can you have that on my desk for review, for review at 4 a.m.? Guess what you're doing? You're going back to the office. You're getting that done, going through a thousand different iterations. So it's on the desk, 4 a.m. He gives you comments. You're working up until 8 a.m. Actually getting through those comments. I'm making it sound really, really bad. It's not that bad. Not all the time, right? Um, I, just, I, I just like what I'm doing. I'm involved in real estate. I like real estate. Um, but anyway, good question. So any other questions before I move on? Yes and no. Um, I felt like I understood the lingo, or at least I, 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 I knew I had heard the lingo before for the most part, but it wasn't working knowledge. And that's just because you're not doing it every day, right? But I, I felt like I was in a position to get up to speed quickly because of the, the schooling I'd gone through. So while I didn't feel prepared to do what I was doing day one, I could get up to speed quickly and understood enough to where I was dangerous within a week of doing, I mean, I shouldn't say I was dangerous. Like I could go run a shop or something like that, but I was dangerous enough to, to like put together a logical presentation and, and like understand risks and opportunities to where I could communi com communicate those enough to where they knew what they, where they needed cor to correct me and guide me. Um, that's a really good question though. I think, I, I think with uh, same is true with like getting married or having children, you're never going to be ready until it's there. Right, and it's happening and you're just going to be learning but the education is to give you a, a, a foundation to build on for sure any more how's like your work-life balance and like your compensation differed from when you're a credit analyst on just kind of on the floor and more hands-on to now where you're where yeah that's a good that's a really good question that kind of speaks to the nature of the two jobs so I'm, I'm usually a pretty open book. I'll be pretty open with you guys as it relates to comp. When I started at Mackay Shields, this is better. So I was at, they called them Mackay, Mackay Municipal Managers. They called themselves M3. So M3, first year I started making $65,000 out of college. Living in Los Angeles, which gets you one bedroom with four other dudes. Um, it was actually, I got the master bedroom and I had my own bathroom. So it was nice, but. I paid for it for sure. Um, to give you some, I'll, I'll tell you that. So I was paying $1,300 rent for my one bedroom, my master bedroom, right? Which was insane, <laughs> but that's what you pay for in Los Angeles. It was, it was a great spot. It was in Brentwood, which if you're familiar with Brentwood, that's where LeBron James lives. I wasn't anywhere near where LeBron James lives. He's up on the hills and I was down in the apartments. I happened to be right around the corner and I didn't know this until I had already moved in. I was right around the corner from where OJ Simpson's glove was found. Um, and the only reason I knew that, I was walking back from the grocery store with arms full groceries. And on my way there, there was, there was two girls outside taking a selfie. And I thought it was, they were just taking a selfie. On the way back, there was like a whole group of, it was a, like a Chinese tour bus. I sat in front of the same house, all taking a picture. When I got home, I was like, what is this house around the corner? And like, oh, that, that was OJ's house. That's where... He didn't kill his wife. Um, anyway, that's, that's where I lived. Um, the way they compensate in asset management is very different than investment banking. In asset management, you have a pool of funds. So we managed, when I, when I left, we managed $80 billion. Someone pull out a calculator. 
what is 65 basis points on $80 billion? So 0 0.0065. What is it? Eighty billion times by point zero zero six five. Hold my phone. Not that high. Something. It's got to be something like like between eighty and hundred million, right? Can you go back to that? Anyway, it was something like 80 to 100 million in revenues, right? Maybe, it, maybe that's not fair because there was one, 520,000. <laughs> well, 80 billion would be 1%, so it's 52. Yeah, so that, so I'm kind of, I'm, I guess it wasn't a fair question totally. But we, we manage about 80 billion on average, roughly 65 basis points was our fee, right? That's what we charged our clients. Some was some were more, right? There was some clients like uh, we, we, when we did a separately managed account, we, were, we didn't really love separately, separately managed accounts. We wanted them to be in our funds. So we charged them a full 100 basis points, charge them more money. And that we, we required $100 million minimums, right? So there were roughly between 80, $100 million in revenue. That revenue, we had a parent company called New York Life Investments. They took uh, something like 60% of the revenue. The rest, the 40% went to M3, right? My company who I worked for, that's who paid me. Then you have a lot of overhead, right? So I, I, I wanna say we had something like 30 million revenue of, of available capital to pay our people. And the four partners took the majority of that, right? How they sized a bonus my first year, they gave me $25,000 bonus, right? So that was my first year comp, whatever that is, 90,000. Yeah. Um, the next year, they bumped me up to 85. But this, this bonus was probably some, they probably had some formula, but it was not a commission at all, right? Sales and trading might have a commission, right? Typically on, on, on the more senior side, like you're a senior managing director, you're probably making some revenue cut, right? Cause you're making, every time you're trading a bond or a stock, you're likely, hopefully you're making money, you're not losing money. And it used to be the case that you would make a certain percentage of every trade you made. That's not the case anymore. Sometimes they'll, they'll give like a revenue share, right? And that's a little bit more, you can calculate what you're making. Here in asset management, it was based more on your seniority. Um, they really liked the, the chartered financial analysts, the CFA. So if you had a CFA, you had a certain increase above what you would have had otherwise. Um, as an analyst, the most I made was 120, I think, all in. That's not true. But my last year's, my, my last year's base was 115,000 and they gave me a $50,000 bonus. I wasn't even close to true. I met my, my base. Um, so that was my last year in, and I was there for four years, right? In investment banking, they are much more performance driven, more commission driven, right? And the more business you do, the more money you make. So you have a, a little bit of a smaller base relative to like, like, uh, like a hedge fund manager or someone at M3, their, their most senior guys would have a base of 300,000, right? Which is, that's good money. Anywhere you live, that's good money. Um, <clears throat> but their bonuses could be several million, right? I mean, the, the, two, the four partners were taking home something like six or seven million a year, right? Just from the, the available capital. Maybe it wasn't that high if we only had 30 million or so, but they took home a lot of money. Investment bankers as a vice president is, which is what I'm at now. My base is 150,000. Okay. That's, that's my base. And then at Piper, they kind of, their, their performance bonus is another 
100,000, right? This bonus is subject, subjective, right? Meaning this is where they're gonna tell you whether they like you or not, right? If they wanna keep you. If they're gonna fire you, you're not gonna get that bonus and you're not gonna have a job. If they're gonna keep you, you're gonna get $100,000, right? If you're on the fringe, maybe you get 90, right? But it's, we kind of think of it as almost guaranteed, right? Uh, if you're doing a good job, if you're working hard, it's kind of guaranteed. And then you have the objective bonus, subjective. And this isn't true for every investment bank, but it, these two components for sure are. This is a percentage, right? And that can range anywhere between one and probably seven to 8%, something like that. And the percentage is the revenue, right? So last year we did $43 million in revenue for my investment banking group. And you can do the math from that, right? I won't tell you what my percentage is. Go ahead. Depends on the shop, really. Traditionally speaking, you're probably an associate by then. No, I started as a vice president. Yeah, yeah. So here I was, this is Mackay. I started as an analyst, right? When I came over to Piper, I started as a vice president. I do not, no. No, it was a little bit more opportunistic than anything. It was the right, right timing, right need for them and the right skill set and right, right knowledge base. So, um, why don't we talk about titles? Where, we'll, we'll start from there. How do, how do you start? Where do you go? So pretty traditional in, in, in finance. Can I? Oh. Nope. That's right. Well, at the, at the top, you have a managing director or an MD. Then you have a director. And you have a VP, then you have an associate, and then you have an analyst, right? Sometimes there's like a senior associate. There's there be levels of all of those depending on the firm. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What year did you graduate college? 2016. Yeah. So generally speaking, out of uh, in investment banking, you get into investment banking as an analyst, right? Out of out of your undergrad, right? Um, that's something like a two to three year period. What you do relative to everybody else, unfortunately, it's kind of the grunt work, but it's also the training ground, right? That's where you're going to learn how to do fin uh, the financial modeling and different iterations of financial models. And you're the one that's doing all of that hard work for your managing director and director for their meeting at 8 a.m., right? With Tim Cook as a funny example. Um, so while your hours here are way worse than that guy, that guy, and that guy, these two are relatively similar, right? You spend two to three years on the bottom rung as an analyst, but you're involved in a lot of deals, right? An analyst, generally speaking, could be on something like five or six different live deals at a time. They've cut that down to where it's now two to three live deals, meaning live meaning like the transaction's actually happening. It's been announced. People know about it. The public knows about it. Now it's a matter of raising money and actually getting approvals to get this deal done. You might have 10 or 12 others that are kind of percolating in the background in the pipeline, or you're doing some work here and there. Your, your managing director has a meeting next month with the company to talk about potential acquisitions. And so every once in a while, you're updating a pitch book or you're updating a financial model or something on that. Then you move up to an associate. That's probably another two to three, maybe, maybe three to four years as an associate, depending on the firm and depending on the group that you're in, which is another nuance we can talk about. But uh, well, actually, before I go on, so, so in, in investment banks, you have industry groups or even product groups, right? So not everybody covers all technology, right? You will have a dedicated team that covers technology companies. You'll have a separate team that covers healthcare companies. You'll have a separate team that covers lodging and gaming, right? Then you have someone like in, in industrials that does whatever industrials and metals and, and mining companies. And then you have a gas and exploration group, right? So you have your, your, your industry specialties. 
or you have a product specialty, meaning like, like you have a leveraged finance group or a financial sponsors group that only does, financial sponsors is like only private equity acquisitions is what you do, right? Or a corporate acquisition is what you do, but that, that's all you do. Those are the clients or, or private equity clients. Uh, leverage finance is a guy in the investment banking group that specializes in using a lot of debt to buy a company or to finance something, but that's, that's more their specialty. And, and, and how long you stay in these different positions might differ based on the group that you're in. But generally speaking, this is a basic timeline. Once you get in as a VP, you're probably something between four to six years, again, depending on the group. And then from here, you're, as a director, you probably spend a minimum of five, maybe even seven years to 10 to 12 years as a director, right? It can be a, a much longer time frame, And then a managing director, you could be there for the rest of your career. Uh, and in some cases, you could be promoted as a partner, right? And that just really, the more seniority you have, the higher you up, higher up you are, the more you're interfacing with a client directly, and that's more your role. Here, your role as an analyst and associate is to get the, the, the financial modeling and pitch book work done, right? You actually are the one sitting at the office getting all that work done. Whereas a, a VP, their role is, is more aligned with associate and analyst, but they're kind of quarterbacking several different deals, right? So they're almost a liaison between the managing director and director and the associate and analyst. Right, so they're, maybe they're not doing all of the work, but they're interfacing with an associate on the, you know, within the technology group. Maybe you have seven different associates that you're interfa interfacing with, and they're all working on different deals. And so you're making sure the modeling work is getting done, the pitch book, pitch book work is getting done, and being done on time, and making sure from an execution standpoint, we're on track, right? Director is kind of a hybrid between the quarterback and the, the rainmaker, the managing director. Much more client interface, a um, little bit less interface internally. You're probably traveling a little bit more, but your managing director and director are the relationship guys. That, that's who is actually delivering the pitch book and walking through the financial model with whatever CEO and, and so on. What do the hours look like for different levels, like for analysts versus where you're at right now? So where I'm at right now is a little bit unique. I work less than what you traditionally think of investment banking hours, right? And the reason is just who my clients are and what we do for them. But as an analyst in investment banking in a bulge bracket firm, you're probably at a minimum 70 hours to an incredibly brutal week of 110 hours, right? That's at the office all day, all night type of work. That has been a problem historically in investment banking. As you can imagine, you're getting incredibly tired and you start hearing people almost brag about, yeah, I started a pitch book at 11.30 at night and I crushed it all night. I had seven Red Bulls. I'm like, sounds terrible. Why did you do that? But like I said, you learn a lot. You're involved in incredibly cool transactions that are changing what people do with their money, how they manage their money. It, it, it's real world impacts what you're doing, right? That doesn't necessarily always mean that you should go spend 80 hours a week at the office, right? And, and you, what, you, what you end up seeing is people leave from an, from an analyst to other jobs, right? One of the... You know, I've spoken to some of the pros, right? Certainly there's, there's money to be made. That's an obvious one, but it cannot be the reason you're in investment banking or else you will burn out and uh, your life won't be fun. <laughs> Just won't be. It's not worth it um, to spend as much time as an analyst. If you're going to be there as an analyst, you want, you want to be there because you think it's interesting, right? Because you like finance, because you like the idea of working on a several billion dollar, multi-billion dollar transaction, right? That's not, these hours aren't every week, right? They're not always intense. During the intense times is when you start feeling it. Intense times are when you're on a live deal. But for the most part, you're probably 70 to 80 hours a week 
a lot of phone calls, a lot of modeling work, but you know, you can, you can plan it, it, when you're on live deals, you can't plan plans go out the window. And I hope I'm, I'm being, I, I, I like investment banking. I think it's really interesting work. I enjoy the interface with clients. Uh, but I, I also want to be real about what the challenges are in investment banking. What's starting for an analyst nowadays? At a bulge bracket bank, you're at 90,000 for an analyst. <laughs> so they pay you for those, those work weeks, right? Yeah, and I, I actually have heard it's higher. Have you heard? So recently, I mean, up to 120. That, that doesn't surprise me. In yeah. New York, right? I mean, in yeah. the big city, some of the things. Uh, yeah. At Piper, what do you think kind of started it? 90. 90. So yeah. you guys are competitive on that end. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I, it wouldn't surprise me if it's higher. I mean, I'm not. Plus I, bonus, that's what's bonus. No, that's salary. That's salary. Yeah. Bonus is probably 20 to 30. Tops. As a start. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as an associate, and it, maybe, maybe my numbers are a little bit dated. You're probably now today like 150 ish at a bulge bracket, right? So bulge bracket pays more, generally speaking. They make more money. They can. Um, middle market pays a little bit less. They make a little bit less money at, at the firm, right? VP, you're probably 200, maybe maybe even 225. This is if like if you're at Goldman Sachs or something like that, or Morgan Stanley. Director, I don't know, is 350. Managing directors, maybe the same, maybe maybe up to 500, but I have no clue. Get your upside on. Huge upside on. Yep, exactly. Um, you know, I've, I, as as a managing director, I've heard as much as like 30 million dollars in a year, right? That they that they took home. But that was an incredible year for what they did, it, meaning the market was friendly enough for them that they could do a lot of deals, which meant they made a lot of commission, which meant they made a lot of money. Um, but there's, I mean, on average, on a down year, you're probably a million, million two or something like that as a managing director. Yeah, I had one more hand up here. Yep, I am. That's, you know, you know with, with my, my, my goal for coming to talk to you guys today is really mostly about elevating your vision of what's possible for you, right? Uh, but also, I'm from Utah. I'm sure the majority of you are from Utah. And Utahns want to stay in Utah for some reason. And they are scared of leaving Utah. But sorry, there's just not as many opportunities like this in Utah. Will there be more? 100%. Is Piper Sandler going to be a part of that? Yes. Is Goldman Sachs a part of that already? Yes. JP Morgan talking about it? Absolutely. But right now, to get into investment banking, especially in, in like the more interesting parts of investment banking, it's going to be New York City. San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Chicago are kind of the main hubs, Maybe, and, and Dallas as well. Maybe Houston if you want to get into oil and gas. <clears throat> but I hope that doesn't scare you, right? Because it can be scary thinking about leaving mommy and daddy, as much as we're all grownups, we're all mommies and daddies, right? We all turn to them for some comfort and, and peace when, when it's challenging and we're a little homesick, right? Uh, but I promise you that as you go out and, and explore these opportunities, going on career exploration trips, you'll start understanding it's really not all that scary to leave home, right? Um, I did. I did a, an internship at a private equity shop uh, for the summer of 2015, I think. Yeah, really good question. It was, yeah. I mean, it was helpful to just talk about, right? It wasn't applicable to my first job, frankly, but they asked a lot of questions about it because they just want to know what I worked on and how I thought about it and what happened. So. How big of a need is this job? Is there a big need for it? Or... In investment banking? Absolutely. Like, I don't, I don't think it'll go away ever. Um, <clears throat> yeah, actually, can I just talk about that? Please, yeah. So uh, something's going to be automated. Even some of the maybe analyst stuff, 
working through models and things can be automated. Doing deals, pitching to investors, talking to clients. I mean, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that just you just can't do it any other way. It's it's not it's not going away. Uh, it's a, really a, more of a soft skill uh, when you get down to it. Yeah, you're crunching numbers and looking at spreadsheets, but um, they've been doing it the same way for 100 years to some extent. And yeah. 100 years from now, they'll be doing something very similar uh, in terms of raising money and pitching deals and raising capital. Yeah, absolutely. Here and then here. So you said you don't have your MBA. Would you say that most of your colleagues that you work with do like would that be something you recommend if you someone wanted to follow your footsteps or would you say I don't worry about it? No, that's a good question. Um I think it depends on when you want to get into investment banking, honestly. Okay. If you want to get into investment banking right out of undergrad, obviously you don't need to because it's right out of undergrad, but you're gonna be you're gonna be an analyst. I would say an MBA to get into investment banking is important for those that want to switch careers to investment banking from something else, right? So if you're an accountant, you're a CPA and you're, you're doing whatever CPAs do, you're doing, uh, I don't know what they do. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. You know, there is a few examples of, of friends that I have that, that wanted to get investment banking. They thought that was interesting. They see the deals. Right. Sometimes they'll advise on deals from a tax perspective, um, or even or even like an accuracy perspective. <laughs> like, yeah, Ben, your model is right. Good job. Um, and I, you're going to pay me uh, two hundred grand for that for telling you that. Um, <clears throat> so they, but they want to be on the other side of the deal. The, one of the few ways you get to get there is by getting an MBA, right? Otherwise, you're trying to get into the junior level, but you've been working for four or five years as a CPA. And maybe you've got, you know, you've got a family and you need to make a certain amount of money to live in New York or Los Angeles or San Francisco to be able to, to feed your family, but they're not going to pay you that as an analyst, right? Yeah. But you're not a VP yet from your experience. So an MBA gets you, gets, gets the door open for you. You're probably going to be an associate, not likely to be a VP, but you're making a little bit more money and you have an MBA. Yeah. Probably, yeah, yeah. Uh, it used to be that banks would send people like not to get an MBA, and almost all of them did that. Yeah, that's where a lot of them is, and they're not doing that as much anymore. Why? Because they, they have got to be employed; they just want to keep them. Yep. Like it's hard to hire people, so they will not send people back to do MBAs and do graduate work, and they'll just keep them. And uh, it used to be you went back to the MBA, you came back, and you got a, a, a pay bump and title bump or whatever else. And now they're like, no, we'll just put you through this track a little bit quicker. <laughs> Keep you around, so it's not as big a deal anymore. Uh, maybe not as valuable as it used to be. Yep, I agree. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about like compensation and fluctuating a lot for like managing directors. What does that look like as like an analyst or associate, like based on the market? Does it fluctuate or not as much? Yeah, it's a little bit more stable. Um, and the reason is, I mean, these guys are the the rainmakers for a reason. That they have the relationships with all of the clients, right? Relationships are incredibly important in investment banking. Right, because you're competing with Goldman. Sachs. If you're at Goldman Sachs, you're competing with Morgan Stanley and J.P. Morgan, and Bank of America, and all of the boutique firms for that one acquisition, right? Where you're going to charge sometimes like 80 million bucks on a on a massive deal, right? Like you're making 80 million dollars for the firm, and you're taking five percent of that, seven percent of that. Uh, it should fluctuate, right? And you're and they're paying you a way bigger salary, so you can handle the, the fluctuation. Whereas an analyst, you know, they're, they're paying you, maybe they're paying you $125,000, but you're not making the, the massive upside, right? They'll fluctuate for sure, but you're not gonna, like if, you, if your bonus is $30,000, it's probably gonna be 25 or $20,000 on a down year, something like that, yeah. And so would you recommend I majored in finance, but that is not necessarily, it doesn't have to be true, right? Um, I think they, they like that. They like seeing that you have a quantitative background, that you like the space, you want to be involved in, in finance. But there are a lot of people at investment banks, more senior now, that like they graduated in history or in general studies. Um, part of the reason is just like the school they went to 
is where they like recruit from heavily. Maybe they got a general studies or a history major from Harvard, right? Like that, generally speaking, they, they, they just like to go to Harvard, right? And recruit from there. But I think someone, if, if I'm looking at two resumes, someone graduated in finance and has a quantitative background and likes finance and someone that doesn't, all else equal, I'm probably going to choose a guy to finance unless I just don't like him. Right, like it's just annoying. So, so another, another another side note here: uh, these are very competitive to get these positions. Yeah, I mean, you think you're working some serious hours and getting paid for it, but these are very competitive jobs. Historically, so maybe back a decade ago, we didn't have any students getting these jobs. Uh, we've got students every year now getting these types of jobs, but the ones that are getting the jobs are the ones that are very engaged. They've got multiple internships. Their resume is dialed in, it's polished. They can sit in an interview and uh, convey their information, be very articulate, and um, basically hit the ground running when they start that, that job. Um, but, but they are, I mean, it's an extremely competitive field. <laughs> All the way up, competitive to get the job, once you're in the job, competitive to keep the job, right? It's, yep. I mean, you're, you're making lots of money, but you're competing for that yeah. as you go. I think another, before before going, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned that you lived in <clears throat> was it California? Yep. You would that have benefited you in regards to like if you started in Salt Lake and it helped to be in a bigger city like that? Yes. A lot. Uh they generally say bigger city, bigger firm, because you can always move down. Yep. So that's that's a general advice to, to people as they're going out in careers. Bigger city, bigger firm is going to start you out at a higher level, and you can always move down to smaller city, smaller firm. Yeah, if if I think about so Goldman Sachs is probably the is is the only big investment bank that has an investment banking practice in Utah. They have investment bankers that live and work out of the Utah office. Their career path looks a little different than someone that starts out in a bigger city. They are almost required to be three years, right? The reason for that is they kind of view Salt Lake, which I think is stupid, uh, as almost a training ground, right? They, they pay them a little bit less because it's not as expensive as New York. And they're on all of the same deals, but it's almost like the prove yourself in Salt Lake and then we'll bring you to New York or San Francisco or LA, right? Everywhere, every other firm doesn't have that. You're, you're in the big city or you're not in investment banking. Okay, we're almost out of time. Uh, let's do, I just have the hands up. Rapid fire questions. So I'm going to, you have to be quick. Two, a couple sentences. Uh, a couple more questions. What else do you have? What else do you want to ask? Yeah. Just, um, I know with like older generations, it seems to be kind of the trend that you go when you get hired at the company, you kind of live there for the your life, you stay there and work your way up. But with recent trends, people move around a lot and it seems to be beneficial that if you want to promote, you can do what you can. Would you recommend that or would you recommend staying at the company and up? I mean, it depends on what you want to do. Investment banking analysts are very well known for leaving from the analyst to another job like private equity or venture capital or hedge funds, right? If you want to get into private equity, that's probably the path you're going to go is analyst, investment banking analyst to private equity associate, right? But I would say if you want to stay in investment banking, stay at the firm. Other questions? Um, so for your work, when you talk about like IPOs, mergers, and acquisitions, do you give valuations? Like do you do the valuations on what the deal would look like? Like you project the cash flows for the company, like on a merger, or you like do an evaluation on stock saying, okay, on your IPO, this is what the stock price is going to look like. Is that what you do? And then you just present that to the client? Correct. Okay. Yep. 100%. And one more hand up here. Your very first day as an analyst, were you accused? What, 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 what happened your first day? I was intimidated, but excited to do the work. Yeah, I don't think I was stressed. I don't think I was overwhelmed. I was just. Did, did they kind of like go ahead and do something, or you knew exactly what you were doing? Oh no, they had to show me. Like, like every firm is different. You don't know what you're going to be doing. Every firm has different software, different processes. They're going to train you on that stuff. You got to be able to solve problems. You got to be able to figure stuff out and and work through issues. Uh, so if you can do that, all of them are kind of the same. Right. Yep. They're going to have customized software, customized processes that they do, and they're going to show you, and you're going to have no idea on day one what those are. Anything else? Uh, what do you wish you would have known that you didn't get from Utah State? 
hands-on modeling work. Okay, we're modeling. We have classes now. We didn't have back then. Paul teaches one. Spin thirty twenty. Ascent or essentials of financial modeling. Yeah, we got a couple of those classes. Question: How much do you work to your colleagues? How much I what? Like team, teamwork versus alone work. Oh. Uh, every, yeah, everything's team based. I mean, you have your individual responsibility of like, when I get the request or when analyst gets a request to do the model work, it's you, right? But as soon as you do that modeling work, it goes to the associate, then the VP, and we're all working on the same thing. It's just the, the one person crunching the number. Uh, if I had to give you an answer, it's probably 30% solo, the rest is team. Okay, uh, he's got cards. You can reach out. I put his contact information up on Canvas. So if you want to talk to him, or find him on LinkedIn. Right, that's good. Yep. Yep, that works. And then uh, let's give him a round of applause.